he's unwilling to accept that his father has flaws because those flaws have provoked a lot of insecurity in him. For one night, one night in your entire life, the universe did not revolve around Edward Bloom. How can you not understand that? I'm sorry to embarrass you. You're embarrassing yourself, Dad. You just don't see it. The themes are themes that are so relatable. The father-son story, which is done in a very unique way here, but is, a, is something that is so relatable to, to people everywhere. That's such a, such a complicated relationship, I think, in every family. I have no idea who you are. Who do you want me to be? Just yourself. Good, bad, everything. Just, just show me who you are for once. I've been nothing but myself since the day I was born. And if you can't see that, it's your failing, not mine. Will is actually a difficult part because everyone loves Edward Bloom, including the audience. And then enter Will, who's the one character that is feeling very different from everyone else. Glad to see you not trying to have a heartfelt talk. One of my greatest annoyances is when people try to talk to those who can't hear them. Well, we have an advantage. My father and I never talk. By this uh, magical end to the film, Will makes a contribution to his father's yeah! life. And in that way, there's a coming together of them. So it's lovely in that way, it's lovely. I think it touched me so, so profoundly, the discovery of the man who he never really believed in he discovers is really a great adventurous soul. Maybe he exaggerated some of the stories a little bit, but the, the truth of it was always the same. That was my father's final joke, I guess. A man tells his stories so many times that he becomes the stories. They live on after him. And in that way, he becomes immortal. I've seen a lot of his movies, and I'm a fan of his movies. My favorite, probably, is Beetlejuice. Edward Scissorhands is a pretty powerful movie for me. Batman, kind of a big fan of the series. Edward Scissorhands is my favorite. I think for all the reasons I love this script so much, for the fantastical nature of it. Here in Hollywood, you, you have to describe it in a couple of sentences, otherwise it's not going to get made, you know? And so it was nice to, to, to work on a movie where that's the whole point, is that you can't really describe it, put it into a real hard category. Things aren't just black and white, you know? There, there can be some uh, things that are both real and unreal at the same time. Yeah, this guy's doing a little figure-eight circle sure. on that road. Yeah, that'd be great. What I liked about the script was the fact that it sort of put images to feelings that are hard to express verbally. I think that's the thing that I liked about it. Well, it was interesting casting this because for the roles of Edward and Sandra, you couldn't think of just one actor. You always had to think in terms of tandem, you know, dual casting. So I felt very lucky that way between Albert and Ewan and then Jessica and Allison, getting those sort of tandem casting working so well. And it's more than just a physical thing. It's it's a it's a it's a spiritual thing, I think, too, where it, people have a certain kind of strength, and then and they both have that. It was during the war. Your father went missing. They thought he was dead. Oh, that really happened. Not everything your father says is a complete fabrication. The structure of the movie is interesting because it doesn't just follow a format of flashback. It has kind of what I consider a realistic way of thinking about memory where it's selective and some things are real and not real, creating its own reality. So there's always a question as to how far visually to push it. Again, we always kept it in some form of reality. The photography, the music, all of those elements are important to... to, to you know, the feeling of it. And then it'll uh, 
get to tremolo like halfway in just as he started to walk. Yeah, on, the, on this shot here. I'm yeah. tasked with the... Uh, Are you going to do that, take that one thing down so it builds up and that one part doesn't get loud? You know, the, you know, I like uh, seeing people I've worked with try new things and go and do, you know, and so that's fun. You, you get a creative spirit back from that and then mixing it up with new people, you know, so it kind of keeps everything sort of fresh and flowing and interesting. Him is flying through. You know, for the, the amount of locations and things, it was a fairly quick shoot. And, you know, because sometimes we were actually changing locations like three times a day. It was such a mosaic and puzzle kind of movie. It was that way anyway. You know, it was little pieces all over the place. It felt like each day was a new movie in some ways. But in some ways, that's good because, you know, there's something really nice about shooting and not taking too long. And I think it helps me, it helps the actors. You know, it's like no fun doing a shot and then an hour later doing another. You know, it's like so the kind of working quickly. I think ultimately helps and it, it keeps the energy and spirit and actors can think of their performance in a bigger picture rather than, you know, having to just be waiting around all the time. A new adventure every day. That's my motto. Tim is a really good audience. It's a great He really likes actors and uh, he likes to see what actors can come up with. Just his character anyway does inform his films. Uh, as with any sort of kind of artist, I think, or filmmaker. So he does have a sense of pathos and sort of whimsy and humor, great humor. Tim's always laughing. We try to make him laugh. It's a very good thing to get Tim laughing. Yeah, See what I mean? Right just here. come at I a little closer yeah. to the lens. No matter where the lens is, right. just go to that. Yeah. I think the thing with great storytellers is that they spin the tale in a way that makes every detail kind of like, oh, I never saw it that way before. Tim has Burtonized, as I put it, the film. You can read it every scene a certain way, and then he'll surprise you with something. And he continues to surprise me every day, because he'll just do something a little differently than you had envisioned it, or another director would attack a scene. Move it slightly closer to him. One of the things that excited us about Tim, which is also one of the things that excited Tim about the project, is that people associate him with the fantasy elements of, of the script and perhaps not so much with the contemporary family drama. So here was a chance to let him do what he does best and also to have him do something new that he hadn't really done before. Okay, ready, and action! Yeah, I mean, I felt like on this there were things that I haven't done before and I enjoy doing. I, I did enjoy what the, the script was about and the, the themes and all. And, and that's the thing that I love about film. It's like when you can show things that are hard to put into words, that can sometimes be something that's, that's very intriguing to try to do. Now, it's common knowledge that most towns of a certain size have a witch if only to eat misbehaving children and the occasional puppy who wanders into her yard. The tall tales of big fish stories harken back to myths, to legends, to fairy tales. When you start talking about all of that, you're talking Tim Burton. Okay. This is his territory. And there's really no one better to bring his own unique vision to that whole side of the story than Tim. Did you get the eye? I brought it. Let's see it. He puts his uh, Tim Burton touch to it, particularly the scenes where exaggeration and the storytelling and the fun and the entertaining parts of it. You know, if you look at folk tales or mythology, there's certain images and places and symbols of characters, witches, giants, werewolves, you know, coming into a mystical city. All of the imagery and symbolism is sort of rooted in those kind of classic themes and structures. Fred! Welcome to you. What's your name? Edward Bloom. Oh, here. Here you are, right here. Edward Bloom. Hmm. We weren't expecting you yet. Spectre is, uh, it really is a dream town where you eat apple pie and everybody is friendly towards each other and it's a little surreal. 
very dreamlike. It feels real, but there's something that's not quite real about it. It has an edge. Uh, the people have an edge. There's a, an edge to what happens, and that's the edge of storytelling. I've been working on this poem for 12 years. Really? There's a lot of expectation. I don't want to disappoint my fans. May I? It's only three lines long. Which is why I should never show a work in progress. And cut. One of the many things that Tim Burton is famous for is the look of his films. And in the case of Big Fish, he called on three brilliant Academy Award winners to help him bring his vision to the screen. Our cinematographer is Philippe Russolo. Our production designer is Dennis Gasner, and our costume designer is Colleen Atwood. I meet with Tim, and you know he sort of fills me in on what he's thinking about, you know, how he sees the movie. There you go. Early on, I knew what the concept was for Spectre, so I was on the lookout for clothes that had the sort of feeling I wanted. The people are very light. They're very kind of ethereal feeling, and it's romanticized or impressionistic kind of place. Come through a little bit further back on, than on your marks here. Okay. Just because, like I said, remember, Mr. Yes, like, yes, like on yours, it was really close. Mm -hmm. So just back it up. Yes. 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 Slower than you might have done. Okay? Yeah. Okay, go. Have to be there. Yeah, look, yeah, exactly. It's like you're trying to get in. That's the camera's head. So. Oh, yeah, well, maybe that's good. Yeah. And action! Yeah. I have to leave tonight. Promise me you'll come back. It's nice to actually to have her, let like, have him go down like that and have her come up. Can I see you yes, sir. Yeah, we'll, uh, nice. we'll get the camera off. We'll just, uh, put it right on there. Yeah, we'll just leave good. the crane sitting where it's at. We've got to pull the last piece of track. we got marks down, guys. So, and you know what? He'll pick up his jacket somewhere in here. Okay. Action! Promise me you'll come back. I promise. Someday when I'm really supposed to. And action! Jenny's one of the first few characters who actually comes out of the storytelling, the fantasy world, and is real. It's a small part, but very significant. And it is kind of interesting, because she has three different guises. And action! I was thinking about death and all. About seeing how you're gonna die. I mean, if that was all you thought about, it kind of screw you up kind of help you, couldn't it? Because everything else, you know you could survive. Playing a character is like adopting a different skin. I mean, like, you know, the other day I did like six hours in makeup or five hours in makeup. And it's all these silicon pieces. And it's like basically a patchwork that they submerge your face in and glue and stick it all on. And then they paint you, and then they get rid of the edges, and it's completely torturous, and uh, I don't really know how I did it. But, I mean, I did do it, because I have done this before. I was in Planet of the Apes, and I kind of was better at it. But I think it's just a shock to be back in the seat again. And... The Witch's House, um, they actually found this incredible location of this very, very old house that was in ruins. But the house had no uh, real roof to speak of. The roof, uh, you know, from there up or so in the trees is, uh, is a, basically a mad painting. There's not a huge amount of special, special effect, visual effects. Is that a mark, Daryl? I mean, the is question around how to achieve all those shots were, were quite enjoyable. We tried to do on camera whatever we could achieve on camera. So we done a lot of shots that uh, on camera or using very simple tricks of playing with perspective, especially with Carl with the giant. By being creative with camera angles, which Tim is very creative at, you find ways to create the impression that he's really large. The shot where he turns over a car. <laughs> Do you see Tamika?
you just put a camera somewhere and you try to put one car where one car here and the, the small car the miniature car in there and then you move them around until something in your brain says oh yes i buy that this is working A lot of it was just done by putting him up on a platform. And what we would do to get the perspective correct on him is we determined sort of the ideal height for Carl was about 12 feet tall. So him being seven feet, six inches tall, to make him 12 feet tall, it's roughly a factor of 1.6. But we created a number of shots where uh, we used the computer to enhance his size. Here we did quite a bit to this shot. We manipulated the scene around them quite a bit to make the scale of the leaves smaller, the scale on the ground smaller, um, taking out plants that gave away the scale of Carl. And then um, Ewan was shot separately. We shot him separately on a green screen and built a ramp that matched the, the incline of the ground so that he could walk, uh, you know, and appear to be on the ground and use that same scale technique for scaling the position of the camera. All the costumes were so wonderful. I liked the red suit the best. I thought it was so imaginative and so cool. It just looked so interesting. There's there so many things going on with it, but at the same time, it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful visual effect. In addition to that, these uh, made shoes for me. I am actually in the Guinness Book for having the world's biggest feet, so it was quite a effort for these people to make these shoes. But that's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, 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 good. I saw you over there going. It's always important, even with any of the imagery, that we always rooted it with actors and people that could bring something to it and not be just special effects and all, because it's about human beings. So even when we were doing things, images like that, we always tried to root it in reality. That's why we built, you know, we shot location and did sets and all of that, just so that it had something real and, and human story about the importance of stories and myths. You watch any movie, you watch or read a book, a comic book, uh, anything. All of our exploration and thinking about things and creative ideas, it's all based on those things. And movies are the same thing. And in the future, it'll be some other form. But it's always rooted in stories. Always has been with us, always will be. Tim has this amazingly theatrical imagination. And the wonderful job of working with Tim Burton is for us to find our way into his mind and help his vision come alive in the film. With Tim, you can have a bit more fun with, with the designs and things. There's a look that's sort of signature and Burton-esque that works very well. And you can't do it with every other film. You can only really do it with Tim films. In that sequence, there's not a real snake used ever. So the snake did have an electric motor in it. It was insulated so that no water could get in there and, and burn out the motor. Matt Heimlich conceived a really brilliant device that was a snake that would just sit on the surface and undulate and swim so you could guide it towards the actress that was in the water. So it's not computer generated, it's actually there. We rehearsed quite extensively with the wolf sequence. M Mr. Calloway? <laughs> the Hellhound basically uh, was a very nice three-quarter puppet that could attack Ewan and really look quite vicious so that you could actually have him right on top of him and have his snarling, biting wolf. The Hellhound was, uh, was an interesting challenge because we had to match the real wolves that were gonna be there on set. Good boy, Ross. The different wolves that Doug Seuss provided, he had about four or five wolves, I believe. We went to Doug's ranch in Utah and saw the, the real wolves there um, a few months beforehand so we could take measurements, uh, color samples, and things like that. 
All of the people that are here under the shop are accomplished puppeteers and performers. And one of the advantages that we've found over the years is that the people that build it become so in tune with what they're building and, and what the, the puppet is capable of. You'll see puppeteers uh, growling and snarling when they're doing something like that because you don't realize you're doing it until you see a video of yourself and you're just like, oh. But it helps you get into the performance. You feel like you're the character and so you can't help but kind of do things like that. It's basically a rod puppet with a cable articulated uh, head and neck and then the gross body movement is controlled via rods and then a completely radio controlled head. We also used Alka-Seltzer mixed in with K-Wine Jelly to give a little bit of a froth to the mouth so that he really looks like he's a little deranged. It was that night I discovered that most things you consider evil or wicked are simply lonely and lacking in social niceties. This is the suit that Ewan McGregor wears for the scene where he's running through the jumping spider forest. They have uh, these filament uh, wires which will we pull our, uh, the cables on the other side. There's a spider set where we have um, our puppeteers on either side of the road that he's entering. And as he's running through here, we also have the mon monofilaments where they'll come down into shot. There'll be CG ones which will move in as well. Set here. Okay, ready. And, and action! action. Is it cut? A lot of actors um, sometimes find it difficult working with puppets, but he was great. He is a really good-natured person, and uh, no matter what we did, he was game for it. Uh, uh, uh. Richard Johnson's crew designed the entire look of the forest. Ewan is walking through the forest, and then the arms could kind of come in and grab at him. I think it's a magical, fun scene, and, and the, the trees are very Tim Burton, sort of the knot holes or eyes in the mouth. They made them into hollow trees, and then a few of those trees would become articulated hero trees, so that they could fit a couple of puppeteers inside, who then did the gross limb and branch articulation. The, the trees were on hydraulic systems so that they could kind of lean in, and then the arms could kind of come in and grab at him. It was a nice collaboration between the art department, uh, us, and special effects. We basically built all the trees on stage, brought them out onto location, and then finished all the artwork off there. But we had video feed, we had uh, video goggles, so we could actually see what was going on through the camera. There's that spark of performance that happens when something's reacting to you, and you then react to that. That's part of our job when we go on, is to give the actors something to respond to. I'd like to take a moment of your time to tell you about my new product, the Handymatic. Jerry Moss, the prop master, came to us and said, you know, would you like to possibly build the Handymatic? And they're basically a fun design of different just little handy tools. We were careful not to put any scissors on it, because I think it would have taken people out of the moment of the film to say, oh, look, it's like an Edward thing, you know? Of the multitude of characters that we, you, that we helped create for Big Fish, from the spiders to the tree limbs to the wolf character, I look at these characters and look at what we've done in Big Fish. The work is stellar, and I'm extremely proud of it. 